last speak, the last speaker in this session, Sandro Popescu. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, without Sandro I would not be here, but uh, <laughs> it would be much less uh, pleasant and I'm not so sure. So S Sandro was at the same time and I uh, was, uh, worked with Yakir. And he will talk about smallest possible thermal machine and foundations of thermodynamics. I still hope there will be some quantum mechanics here too. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, yes, I'm not sure. There were definitely moments when I was sure he will not be here uh, in our long years together. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, he survived. <laughs> okay, well, so today I'm going to talk about uh, smallest possible thermal machines and foundations of thermodynamics. Uh, since it starts with personal things, let me first uh, um, put the blame here, who is to be blamed for this thing, and is here in the audience uh, smiling, and that is uh, Hans Briegel, who once came to visit me, and he discussed about whether or not it is possible to have quantum effects in biology. At the time when he visited me, uh, most people were convinced that, uh, well, there is nothing like that, <coughs> especially no entanglement, because, you know, entanglement is a very fragile thing. And despite the fact that at the very beginning of quantum information, people thought that perhaps, you know, since entanglement gives such a power for computing, perhaps our brains are uh, doing quantum computations, Perhaps one can explain telepathy by entangled brains and so on. But very soon it was dismissed. And it was dismissed because clearly by all we know how difficult it is to keep. In lab, one has to isolate the system, one has to cool, one has to pay lots of money, while biology is hot and wet. And of course, one wouldn't expect to see quantum effects. But while uh, Hans was visiting, we realized that the intuitions about why there cannot be any really non-trivial effects in biology is because people more or less thought of sort of quasi-equilibrium things. But biological systems are <coughs> open, driven systems far from equilibrium. You know, I don't want to reach equilibrium very soon. So, uh, uh, and what can such system do? Well, they um, can do error correction. And there are many, many ways in which you can do error correction. But one of those possibilities would be that perhaps biological molecules can act as a refrigerator and cool a part of themselves. And once they do that, then perhaps quantum effects can survive. So then, one of the many, many questions that we discussed was, could biological molecules act as refrigerators? We just threw that question, and then I started working on it. So the very first thing that I realized is that I don't have any clue about what biological molecules are, let alone how they would work. So what does somebody in such a situation? Well. One thing you could do is you go to the library or you go to the internet, you get the best book on biology and you start studying and studying and then hopefully you get to this. Uh, well, the other thing is to forget everything about it. And that is precisely what I did. I just forgot everything about it. Well, not everything. But then I said, let me just keep the basic idea and go back to things that I know. And things that I used to know at that time were qubits. So then I said, instead of looking at big biological molecules, let me just ask how to construct very small machines, where very small would mean a few qubits or something like that. Once I would know that, perhaps I would know about biology. So from now on, this talk, there will be no biology anymore. I forgot about it. And I go back to the ideas how to construct very small thermal machines. 
Well, we ask small, meaning a few qubits or something like that. But then, because I like foundations, I thought, let me not ask this. Let me ask, what are the smallest possible? Ah, what is a thermo? A refrigerator at home, for example. Or a big steam engine that works, works, and Carnot studies it, whatever. I'm going to go to small ones. So, you know, <coughs> one would imagine that thinking of making a rather small one is easier than trying to do the smallest possible. Actually, that is not the case. Whenever you are going to ask a fundamental question, that turns out to be easier because you get rid of all kind of unnecessary details. So this is what I'm going to talk here. And of course, at that time, we didn't know anything about any other things of reference. We just went ahead and did the things. And then we learned that many things were done by many other people. And many other interesting things were discovered. But it was good for us that we didn't know anything like this. We could uh, just think by ourselves. So here are questions that we, we addressed. Uh, first of all, what does it mean, smallest? You have to be a bit careful. We want the machine to be self-contained. If you really want to talk about small, you need to account for every degree of freedom. So self-contained would mean no external source of work. So of course, those of you that work in optics, they know that you can cool an atom very easily. By now, you can cool it to very low temperatures. But then it's not only the atom, but it's the atom plus the laser and the entire equipment. So we don't want to allow for any external source of work. Here is one more interesting. No predetermined unitary transformations. People working in quantum information are used with unitary transformations. But a unitary transformation implies an external clock that applies a Hamiltonian for a given period of time, implies completely uh, knowing what is happening, not allowing for any other fluctuations. And then you ask yourself how difficult it is to actually create that <coughs> control part. Of course, you need to allow some sorts of free energy. Otherwise, thermal machines will not work. So what we allow, we allow them to be in contact with two thermal baths, but every exchange of energy will be completely incoherent. OK. So these are the sort of questions we would ask. How to construct very small machine? What is the minimal size? How well do they work? Is there complementarity, size efficiency, and so on? By the way, when I talk about size, you may think, what exactly do I mean by size? Is it very small, or is the weight of it? Actually, quantum mechanics gives me one abstract way to talk about size, and that is number of quantum states. Yes, so, please. So when you say you, you allow a contact to a thermal bath, yes. does the thermal bath have now a memory time? No, let's suppose it has Markovian. completely Markovian so that I'm not using those degrees. This is a very good point. Yes, that is all I will allow. Markovian contact with, with thermal bath. Otherwise, I would need to Otherwise take into account those degrees of freedom that act coherently with it. <coughs> okay, so first of all, this was in fact the only thermal machine that I actually knew how it works. Uh, this is Feynman's example. Suppose you have a box with gas in it. And these are molecules that just go around. And here I have a pedal wheel. And the molecules may collide. And when they collide, they move the wheel to the left, or they move the wheel to the right. Actually, what I would like, I would like this wheel to move in one given direction. So then I can hook it up to a weight and lift the weight. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. Because some molecules hit it on the left, some hit it from the right. So the wheel will move clockwise, anti-clockwise, and so on. We'll just fluctuate. OK, here's how you solve it. You hook this wheel with just an axis here to another wheel that has teeth. And these teeth are non-uniform. 
they have a steep slope and a shallower one. And this is the well-known ratchet and pole. Here you have a little stick connected by a spring that comes here. So see what happens. If a molecule hits the paddle wheel clockwise, then the wheel turns. When there is a molecule that hits it from here, the wheel gets stuck there with a little stick, and it doesn't move. So in the end, this wheel will move just one direction clockwise, and now I can hook here a weight and lift it up. And that is the way in which I can extract energy <coughs> from these molecules. Well, so far so good, but there is a problem. This thing actually does not work. And the reason it doesn't work is the following. You see, when the wheel turns clockwise, it pushes the little stick up, and then the little stick falls behind the tooth. But it doesn't stay there. It starts jumping up and down. And very soon, this movement of the little stick gets thermalized to the temperature of the bath here. And now, when it is up, the wheel can also move backwards. So nothing has actually been obtained. But there is a way to solve that problem. And that is, you just need to cool down the little spring. And you do that by immersing the spring in another box with a gas at a lower temperature, T2. So now these oscillations are damped, and now the wheel can turn, and the weight that is connected here can be lifted. The result of that, however, is that part of the energy from here goes in lifting the weight, but other part is now dissipated over there. And this was the big discovery of Carnot, that you always need to dissipate a little part. Of course, this is a classical machine, but I want to see all the basic things. You need a constraint here that will, uh, will rectify the movement. You'll need two bath, and that's what I would like to do at the quantum level. So, the smallest possible refrigerator. Imagine that you have one qubit, and this is the qubit that I would like to cool. This qubit, imagine, it is in an environment a temperature T1. What it does, it spends some time on the ground state, from time to time it goes on the excited state, ground again, up, ground, and I would like to make it spend a longer time on the ground state, that would mean that I'm cooling it. So here is a way of doing it. You come uh, next to it, you put another qubit. And you allow them to interact in such a way that when my qubit of interest is excited, it can fall down to the ground state while pushing the other one, this is my machine, on the excited state. So now there are two phenomena. One phenomena is interaction of the environment with the qubit, and the other is giving its energy to this system. So there is one way in which, one supplementary way in which my qubit of interest can spend its energy, hence it will stay more on the ground state. Well, I wish that would be true, but it isn't. Because at the same time, when this one became excited and this is ground, there is also this transition. This is the bad one, I put it in red. And this one, will warm up again my qubit of interest. Now, what is important is that Hamiltonians in quantum mechanics are Hermitian. That's why evolution is unitary, that's why we have second law and everything like that. That means that the coupling in the Hamiltonian that describes this transition is the same as the coupling that describes the opposite transition. OK, so here is a way in which I can uh, solve this problem. Suppose instead of having this one immersed 
in an environment at the same temperature as the first one, I immerse it into a temperature T2 smaller than T1. So see what's happening. Because the temperature now here is smaller, sometimes the environment will take my machine qubit down to the ground state. Now, because it is the ground state, it no longer pushes, and that is via interaction with the environment, not via interaction with my qubit of interest. So now it is on the ground state, and this transition no longer occurs. Now, my qubit of interest can do this, then this one gets this excited, and my qubit of interest remains more on the ground state. So like this, I succeed cooling my qubit of interest with a machine made out of a single qubit. What is temperature? Or oh, temperature. You know, you put your finger in a, in a bath that is... Oh, there's an environment here. I didn't put it. This environment, you know, just put some water around it. Oh, here I have a supplementary environment. Imagine this is a, a big bottle of water out surrounding it. So, so this is a super naive question, but why not just put the qubit that you want to cool into the cooler? Ah, side? okay. No, th this, was, this was made just to spot the, the clever ones. Uh, okay, so this is perfect, but this is essentially an ice cube. It's uh, no wonder that you cooled that one. Uh, right, this is not what you want to do, but at least you identified how the constraints work. Unless this qubit is here, you know, the transition, the red transition doesn't work. So here's how you do it. Uh, let me see. Right. You take two qubits here. And this is the qubit of interest, and these are two other qubits. Now, the transition that you're interested is your qubit goes down to the ground state, but also the third one goes down to the ground state, and you push up the middle one. The relation are such that the energy is conserved. These two energies are identical to that one. The unwanted one is the triple transition in red, in which the middle one goes down and the side ones go up. If all these three qubits are at temperature T1, really the green one is exactly as frequent as the red one, and you didn't do anything. But they all need to be in place in order for the wrong transition to occur. This one has to be ground, this one has to be excited, this one has to be ground. <coughs> you can prevent that, making the temperature of the environment of this guy smaller, in which case you remove it from the excited state and put to the ground. But that, again, would be the ice cube. But now you see here, if I make the temp environmental temperature of this qubit higher than the others, then I remove it from the ground state and I put it excited. Now they are no longer in place for the red transition to occur. So in this case, now I succeed really to cool my thing. So now I have an engine here that consists of two qubits, one in contact with a temperature T1, the other with temperature T2 larger than any other temperature, and it works like a refrigerator. In fact, I can, uh, I can do even better than two qubits with a one Q treat, but I don't want to complicate things. Uh, as a matter of fact, this will work all I need is to have some transitions. I'm looking at the transition between excited, ground excited state to ground excited ground. And I would like this transition, which this excites the first qubit, to be more frequent than the other transition. So as long as the populations that produce one transition are larger than the other. So here's the population when these two are excited, and this one is ground, given by their Boltzmannian. As long as you have, in more cases, these two excited and this ground, then the opposite, 
the entire system works as a refrigerator. You must see that in this situation, energy is taken from here, but energy is dumped into this one, into the middle one, which is essentially the spiral at the back of your refrigerator at home. This energy is then dissipated into its environment. OK. I discuss here about a refrigerator. Refrigerators are generally more complicated things. I started with discussing Feynman's example of a machine that produces work. So what was the reason I decided to talk about a refrigerator at the beginning? Well, part of it is because my discussions with Hans, part because I was confused. And you see, when you talk about work, Work is the way in which you pump energy into a system in an ordered way. Heat is something that is disordered. But when you are talking about systems with finite number of degrees of freedom, what is ordered, what is disordered, I was confused. Uh, and I remain confused till I realized that actually all I want is to have my engine small, but not a system into <coughs> which I push things. So here is a heat engine. So what is work? Well, I took the definition that work means to take a weight and lift it. Doesn't matter how big the machine is. So here is my quantum weight. It's just a system that has an infinite number of energy levels from minus infinity to plus infinity. It's essentially like lifting this weight on a staircase or making that wheel move tooth by tooth. How am I going to lift it? Well, here's my engine. My engine is again just made out of two qubits. And the interaction is the same. The interaction now, I have this higher energy here. E2 goes down and pushes the two sides up. This is lifting the weight. And this is putting energy into the spring that then needs to be cooled. In order for the weight to go up, I need this transition to be more often than the bad transition in which the reverse will happen. And that is the case when the population of this qubit that drives, this is the engine, the population of it being excited is larger than the population of this being excited, which will then drive the opposite one. So as long as this temperature, T2, is larger than T3, and the energies are such that the population here is larger than the population there, this weight will just go up and up and up and up. Right, here we have already the basic elements. But now, once we understand this, we start playing with them. You see, nothing is done till you really start playing. And now you start asking more interesting question. What is the efficiency of these small machines? Now, you may recall from uh, elementary thermodynamics that when you want to lift the weight, you have to spend some energy in the cold bath. Not everything goes, exactly as I described. But you may imagine that you can minimize that and make it smaller and smaller. Well, what Carnot discovered already many, many years ago is that there is a limit to that. You cannot increase the efficiency of a machine as much as you want. So when you have a hot temperature of a hot bath and of a cold bath, the ratio between the work that you extract by lifting this mass M to the heat that you extract from the hot bath, the work over the heat from the hot bath, is not one. You cannot convert the entire heat into work, but is one minus the ratio of the temperatures. And this is the best you can hope to attain. So here was a question that we addressed. This is the best. But of course, 
In order to do the best, you need to engineer properly your system. Of course, you can always make a bad machine. And the bad machine will not come even close to its maximum Carnot efficiency. Uh, and there are plenty of bad engineers around. Uh, my refrigerator at home is no, no way close to Carnot. Uh, now, when we discuss about the smallest machine, is no longer a question that the engineer is bad, but we impose some constraints on the design of it. So we are not allowing the system to have as many states as we want, but only have two qubits or four possible states. So now the question is, yes, please. Yes. No, this is the best over everything. Not yes, over the small. This thing, assuming yeah. you don't know what happens. Well, th this is the best uh, a machine will can work. That's you. You hook a machine to two temperature bath. It cannot assuming do. You, don't have the resolution. you may have any resolution as you want, but you are not allowed to upload information from your own. The machine can. You are not allowed to upload a database that tells you where the molecules are. The machine can have very high resolution. That's not a problem. OK, so the point was, now you are constrained in the design. The number of states is finite. So you ask yourself, what happens now? Yes, please. Something, what way the number of states is finite? You couple it to a thermal bar. No, your, your, engine is, your engine is finite. But, but is it a well-defined distinction? What the engine and what the bar? Yes, the engine are these two qubits. And the bath contain couples to it incoherently. Anything that is coherent happens only in the machine. The bath happens but incoherently to it. Uh, well, uh, OK. Uh, Technical, uh, technically, you take a master equation. Or the other way is you have no memory. From time to time, you just thermalize a qubit. You, have, you use no memory in the external system. That means you, you, you define an occupation number of the ground and inside is the for the bath. For the bath, yes. Well, the qubit, no, the qubit, uh, well, there are many processes going on at the same time. So you have three qubits, you have three thermal baths that from time to time they thermalize it. At the same time, your three qubits interact with one another. So they never reach the equilibrium thing that they would reach if they would be alone. You have all the processes going at the same time. But do I have some uh, small parameters by which I... Yes, uh, you may want to use... Yes, you may... Uh, so I try to... Uh, I'll come back. I try to, to just put the concepts. Yes, you have a small parameter. If the interaction Hamiltonian is much, much stronger than the Hamiltonian of the qubits themselves, or than the interaction with the bath, then that would be dominant, and I cannot use all these formulas that my, um, my qubits will get thermalized to the Boltzmannian of the bath with their free Hamiltonian. Then I would have to use the interaction Hamiltonian. Would you say the interaction so imagine, the imagine that the interaction Hamiltonian the interaction between, who and who? between all my three qubits the that are responsible for, for the change. Let me take that interaction to be weaker than the separation of levels, and weaker also the separation of levels to be dominant, more than the thermalization with the external things. Yes, please. Yes. yes. Exactly. Yes, that's good. So, uh, but there is a lot of other bad engineering in the thing. Uh, no, the point is they are not ideal, but the, the only serious point I wanted to make here is that here you are constrained. So the question is, how strong are these constraints? So you may imagine that as you have in quantum mechanics complementarities, you, there is a trade-off. You may get fewer states with less efficiency, or you may get 
maximal efficiency towards Carnot with infinite number of states. So that is a reasonable thing. And the question is, is there any such complementarity? And the answer is, no. You can do a very good machine. You can theoretically achieve the Carnot limit even with the simplest machine. Uh, how do you do that? Well, this is exactly what you said. Uh, a machine working at the Carnot limit has essentially to do nothing. Has, it's reversible, so it goes as often forward as backward. So in this limit, I want the transition that will raise up the weight to be as common as the transition that uh, lets the weight down. Really, at Carnot, nothing happens, only that the thing fluctuates and it randomizes the, the height of the weight. In fact, to prove that you reach Carnot efficiency is very easy. Uh, what I need, I need the population here to be the same as population there, because the population here drives <coughs> the good transitions, while the population of this qubit in the excited state drives the bad transition. So you want uh, those two Boltzmannian to be the same, E3 over T3 to be equal to E2 over T2, which, of course, I can get rid of the exponentials, and this is my relation. Now, I don't know how quickly this works. There are all the parameters, parameters that you ask. What is the coupling constant between the qubits? What are the couplings between the qubits and their bath? And so on which I decided not to talk about. Those tell a complicated thing about how the energy transfer, how the work depends as a function of time. But one thing I know, whenever this one, sorry, whenever this one goes up, this one has to go down and this one has to go up. So work and the energy passed into their environment goes in little portions. It is not the case that this one can use something while these ones do not. All the time, this is the triple transition. So that means that the ratio of the work, the Q2, which is the energy extracted from the hot bath, and Q3, which is the energy that goes into the cold bath, is the same as the ratio of the separation of energy levels. Now you put all these things together, it means that you can essentially replace energies by, uh, by work and heat, and you immediately get your Carnot efficiency formula. It's almost trivial, and you almost get ashamed by the time you, you do it, but you are also very happy, till you discover other people might have <coughs> known it before, and some of them are even here. Uh, but let me come to a more interesting thing. What is work? You see, I started by saying that when we talk about small systems, what is work is actually not very clear. And if you are to go and look in papers, which I didn't do at that time, you get completely confused. Because people talk, have many, many different definitions of what work is at that level. Uh, many of those, all of them have good motivations. Uh, many of those discuss about changing a macroscopic parameter in a Hamiltonian that has to do, for example, with moving our piston outwards. We took here the idea that work means lifting of a weight. But there is actually much more once you think <laughs> like that. Let's go and look again to this system, but let me focus to only two levels and ask myself, what actually is happening there? So let me take my weight not to have an infinite number of levels, but just two levels. So my refrigerator works as before, and it just pushes my system upwards. And in fact, what I will realize, I will realize an inversion of population. 
You see, population inversion and negative temperatures were discussed a lot in a very restricted area, which is especially laser physics and things like this was important, but in some sense marginal to the physics. While work is one of the basic principles of the basic notions in physics. What we claim is that making, doing work is making population inversion. And making population inversion is nothing else than doing work. They are one and the same thing. As a matter of fact, there is something even more to say there. You see it in the elementary thing. I just lift this weight. Oops. It was on the ground state. Now it is on an excited state, and I depopulate the ground state. I actually produce inversion of population. There is something even more interesting there. Well, let's go back. What do actually, actually, yes, please. I change many things. This is not an equilibrium thing. Right. Of course I change the entropy. But, uh, I think most reasonable well, first of all, it is not clear that you can do work without um, changing the entropy. You see, things are delicate. Classical thermodynamics has no fluctuations. If you actually look what is happening in a machine that lifts a weight, that weight is not raising uniformly, has fluctuations. So if you would start many machines in the same state, you will see that the weight is randomized. You, you have to be careful with this. But let's go with the flow, and let's see where we get. What do thermal machines do, actually? Let me go back here. This is my example. And the transition that I was looking is a transition that takes ground excited ground to excited ground excited. The first system, the first state represents my system of interest. The other two represent my machine. Now, my machine has four levels, ground ground, ground excited, excited ground, excited, excited, but here I'm only using two of those states. So let me call this state excited ground by E and GE by ground, because you see the energy of excited ground is E2, while the energy of ground excited is E3, that is smaller. So now, if I look like this, I have my system that interacts with the qubit, not with the four levels there. This qubit has two levels, excited and ground. And of course, the energy difference between this and that is the energy difference of the excited state of the second minus the excited state of the third, which is nothing else than E1. So here it is. This is my system. And now I look on the machine as a composite. My system interacts with the machine. I don't want to separate the machine in pieces. I want to look at the full machine. So what I see is that my system interacts with the virtual qubit of the machine. And that virtual qubit is exactly at the same separation as my thing. And when I take small interaction, they just work at resonance. So is that a sign that I have to leave? OK. So what is happening, actually, my system is put in thermal contact with this virtual qubit of the machine. OK? And in simple thermal contact, because all it happens is that it exchanges energy. This one gets excited, that one goes down, and the other way around. So it is a pure, pure thermal contact between them. Is that helping? Is that me? It's a car alarm. OK, good. I'm not alarmed. Uh, right. 
Now, let me get back to this. If you can focus a little bit more. Uh, huh? Engineering works from time to time. <laughs> Good. This one we know, it's a temperature T1. What about this? Remember what these two levels represent. This level represents ground, exci uh, sorry, ground excited, and the other level represents excited ground. So I can ask, what are the population of these two things, which I can find out just by looking, that is the population that uh, this one was excited and the other ground, and vice versa. <coughs> so now I can ascertain the two populations for these two things. Since I know the energy difference and there are just two levels, I can associate to that a virtual temperature. So here is a virtual temperature, which in fact you can calculate very easily to have this expression. E2 minus E3 over that ratio. So what is happening is that the way in which the thermal machine works, you have a system that has its environment at T1. You have the rest of the machine, but it interacts only with a virtual thing. That is at this T virtual. If this T virtual is smaller than T1, this is a refrigerator because I put my qubit in contact with something colder. If this T virtual is larger than T1, I have a heat pump. I warm that up. If this T virtual is negative, I have a machine that produces work. And now you see why really looking at work as inversion of population is important. It means that my machine that first naively I thought of being made out of pieces, if I think of being the full composite quantum system, is at a virtual temperature that is inverted. This is the machine. But the machine is ultimately in contact with the thermal bath. So let me take a step backwards and see what is actually happening there. What is actually happening there is this. Here is my system that interacts with its environment. Here is one of the qubits of the machine which interacts with its environment. Here is the second qubit of the machine interacting with its environment. These, are, these environments are thermal bath. So they are, have a Boltzmannian distribution each of them separately. And they are pretty boring. A Boltzmannian is really a boring thing. So you know the ratio of population here corresponding to T2, here another one corresponding to T3, and so on. But my machine acts on these two thermal bath. So I want to look at my thermal bath as one composite object and describe the energy levels, not separate, but the energy levels of this system, which are the two thermal baths put together. And now you see, the way in which they interact, if the interaction is small, it's just a resonance where this qubit interacts with some levels at the same energy. This is why it's easy to do the same uh, small interactions. Then everything is at resonance. So now let me look at those thermal baths together and put their levels. Again, you can see that since the transition is just excited ground and, uh, and ground excited, they only take this one like <laughs> this and like that. So it only activates two levels from the bath. So here is the full image. Here is the system. It interacts with its environment, and in fact interacts with the levels in each environment that are similar to the levels of your system. <laughs> Don't you want to talk about the level spacing in the team, but in the environment that's being basically zero? No, there are many, many, but this one in the limit of small interaction just interacts with those at resonance. You can complicate, you can complicate, which you may think of it as discrete. Now, you may complicate this and you may go to that, but let me just stick with really the fundamental things. I try to, 
to put the concepts before, then, then you have to work a lot just to see and put all the details in. But basically the idea is that the system interacts with levels, and there are many, there are many degenerate levels in its environment. It interacts with the qubit of the machine that is exactly at the same level, and just by ordinary thermal contact. And the machine interacts with levels in the bath that are at T virtual. So essentially, the bath already, they are very boring if you look each bath by itself. It's just, just a Boltzmannian. But if you look at the two baths as a composite object, and you look at the energy eigenstates of this composite, and you look with what are the levels that are important here, you see that the population of those global energy levels is in ratio that is not T1, that is not T2, but, well, you have all kinds of temperatures there. You have virtual temperatures that range from negative to positive to higher than the highest to lower than the lowest and so on. And what the thermal machine does, it just sticks its hand inside this bath to get in touch with the correct virtual qubit from the bath. And then you have ordinary thermal, uh, thermal connection between all these things. Now, depending on the, cup, on the coupling between them, you know, it's like you have one bath at T virtual, another object, another object, a bath at T environment, and there might be a flow of heat one way or the other, and the actual temperatures at which these settle, that depends on the coupling. Ah, there is something more. Now I understand what Carnot means. If I put in contact things that are this and that at different temperatures, uh, I will waste. It's irreversible. So Carnot is when T virtual is the same as the temperature of the environment of my qubit, of my system. This shows something else. You see, T virtual if I go back, was based on the energy separation, and the energy separation is given my system, and the temperature of the bath. If I would want to couple different levels, so I would have more than two levels here, I would have three levels or four levels in the system and in the machine, they would couple with different things here. Their temperatures, are fixed, T2 and T3. But if the energy levels are different, then T virtual would be different. But in order to have a Carnot engine, I need a single T virtual here, because I have a single T environment that is fixed. So it means that if I would have a system or, or a machine with more levels, more than two levels, I cannot obtain Carnot efficiency. I have Carnot efficiency if and only if, well, only if my machine has two levels. So I started by saying perhaps there is a trade-off. Perhaps the smallest machine cannot reach Carnot. Now I found that it can. Now I'm making one more step. In fact, I claim that it is the only machine that can reach Carnot. And in fact, all classical machines that reach the Carnot limit do by decoupling most of their energy levels and in practice converting themselves to a two-level machine. That is what is happening. And once you have this, you can play. For example, here is the T virtual, but I will not insist on that. You can ask many other things. I will just go over them. Let me tell about the strength of work. This is a new notion that I suggest. Uh, I claim that to do work is to make an inversion of population. But work is simply defined classically. You just lift up the weight. But here I have many different negative temperatures. So in some sense, some negative temperatures, you know, 
are stronger than the others, the ones closer to zero from the negative side. So in some sense, those will produce more inversion of population. That is work in a stronger way, which has nothing to do with the time scales. The time scale is a different issue altogether that has to do with the coupling constants. There is something else. Uh, perhaps I should go backwards. Carnot efficiency is obtained when the system goes backward and forward, backward and forward at equal rate. That means essentially infinite temperature when you have the ground and the excited state the same. That is right on the border to ordinary positive temperatures. So in some sense, the Carnot engine, although it's the most efficient, is the weakest. And again, is not weak in the sense of time that you need to do. But if you tinker with it a little bit, it ceases to become a heat engine. But the, the weight will just drop instead of raising. You can do other things. You can define genuine thermal machines. What is genuine? Well, there are many ways in which I have 10 more minutes. Oh, I just wanted to finish, including questions. Good. Uh, you can have a refrigerator in many different ways. Your refrigerator at home actually works using work. You have some temperature bath that is are sitting in, in, the, in the power station and uh, whatever. But in fact, you just plug it into, into uh, the power supply. So there you use two temperature baths somewhere else to generate work. And then that work is done to run the refrigerator. A genuine, and in that case, there is no inversion of population at any moment. You might think it in a more general term, but the actual machine is with a supply of work. That is not a genuine one. A genuine one is the one where you put the system that you want to raise in contact with a negative temperature. Why is this important is because the type of changes that occur in the environment, they depend on what virtual qubits you are depleting. And you are depleting other virtual qubits in the environment when you have a machine that first converts things into work, then work into whatever, you know, a temperature smaller than T1. So for example, for a, uh, for a refrigerator, what you would like for a refrigerator, if you want, you have two temperatures of the environment, T1 and T2, you just want a T virtual that is smaller than T1 and T2. But in order to first convert it into work, you will need a T virtual, but this is a positive thing, <coughs> that is smaller than zero. So you consume too much that you don't need in order to run a refrigerator. You don't need to convert it into work. So you can get things like this. Or let me talk about an entropy change. When you have three systems, the change of entropy is Q2 over T2 minus Q1 over T1 minus Q3 over T3, when these are the heat flows and these are the temperatures. But you can view them when you have two things that are in contact that you have the same heat going into your system at temperature T1 and is coming out from the composite bath at T virtual. So now you just have two things in ordinary thermal contact but at different temperatures and you can immediately compute the change in entropy of the things. So now you have a machinery for asking different questions about thermodynamics. You can use this machinery, for example, to extract work from individual quantum systems. Previously, I talked about a full thermal bath, but suppose I have an individual quantum system in any state that I want and a big thermal bath associated. So usually, when you have some macroscopic system, 
but not infinite, and a thermal bath there, you can use that to extract work that is equal to the change in free energy of this thing when you thermalize it to the temperature of the bath. Exactly the same formula works quantum mechanically. You can extract work from an individual quantum system by processing it individually, and on average, it's the change of free energy. So now you have a tool to go forward, and uh, well, I hope that you are interested enough to want to take a look by yourself. Thank you very much. Ah, I'm the perfect person to ask. I'm a theoretician. <laughs> so if there are experimentalists here, they are welcome. <laughs> this is handed to me. But, but uh, one comment is I think if you, that mach machine that was a variation of Fe uh, Feynman's device. Yes. If you increase the weight a bit, doesn't it turn into a refrigerator? It cools the, the system that's connected to the pole and it heats Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Back to the biological question, I'm a bit here confused because so you're talking here about the second order effect, right? Here? No, biology? it's not necessarily, it's second order effect if I would realize the coupling by pairwise. But this is the only way you can do it. Well, I can use instead of this a Q-treat. I didn't want to do that for pedagogical reasons. To see a Q-treat would be more complicated. Uh, in principle, when I think of quantum mechanics, there is nothing that would prevent me to, to have a first order effect. But if it's really qubit, then it seems to be very slow because it's second order effect. On top of this, if you put the heating rates in, then if the heating rate is too high, it won't work. If it's too, too slow, Look. We're extremely slow because then the other process. So it First of all, these two qubits, they could be two um, different properties of the same particle, in which case, like spin and, and locations or something else. So there is no need for them to be pairwise. It's pairwise only if you think them as, you know, three individual particles in the game. So there is no conceptual thing. The other thing, I don't need it to be uh, the interaction to have a small coupling. But then I would have to work mathematically much harder, and I'm a lazy person. Just the other, if you really want to do a second order effect, I think it's an easy experiment, by the way. Uh, well, what is easy and what is, uh, I don't want to talk about what is easy experimentally. I believe it is easy, yes. But, you know, experimentalists will tell me that they need far more funding than I would imagine. <laughs> I think if you look at a lot of uh, thermodynamic processes. So, could you? Yeah. Yes? I mean, you, in most of these things, you invest a lot in building your equipment, and you have to get a return on it. And for instance, the desalination plants work at about 50% efficiency. Automobile engines at somewhat less and so on. And I think the biological systems that are assembling DNA and so on are fairly close to the 100% efficiency, yes. but not. But again, you have to build a leaf or something like that, and you want to use it. You don't want to use it at exactly the maximum yeah. efficiency. And, uh, but very often, they're, they're somewhat close to 50%. Well, again, I'm uh, so happy that I'm not an experimentalist. I can do conceptual things and uh, yeah. Okay, I think we have to we have to stop now. It yes. was almost no no quantum but uh, very very enlightening talk. Oh, there there, there are quantum things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want the fridge to work harder, it needs to be entangled. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but that is for the next time. Thank you very much. We will meet at 6 o'clock uh, in, in the morning in front of the main gate to the university and we will return to about the same point.
We are going to run re really, really fast, and if you bring your camera, uh, try to make the path to some interesting uh, part. Uh, and if you are not uh, registered, you should still come here.